everybody doing today? Good morning. Doing good. Good morning. Yeah. Doing great, but not not as good as you, Tom. <laughs> well, you know, it's my wife's birthday and it's our anniversary. So, um, and what's awesome is I've, I was able to completely unplug. Um, I'm using my vacation phone, but I'm totally off the grid. No calls, nice. no texts, no emails, no nothing. Awesome. Um, thanks to um, an amazing team. Thanks to Eric and Stephanie and Natalie. And also thanks to EXP. I mean, I never would have been able to do something like this before EXP. I know. So how are you doing, Matt? Doing fantastic. It's great to see everybody on here. I love it. We got some rock stars here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, hey, you know what? Let's go ahead and get started. Um, we have uh, Mike Devlin here today. Mike is uh, one of the top brokers, team leaders, coaches, mentors um, in the entire country. And he is one of the most well-versed individuals to discuss and to share this uh, NAR settlement. So, Mike, maybe you could share a little bit about yourself, and let's just jump right into our content. Sounds good. Is it okay for me to share my screen? Has that been... Absolutely. Yes. All right, because I have goodies for you. Um, anyhow, I'm... Um, a coach, an icon instructor, a mentor with uh, EXP. I was a productivity coach for KW for seven years, and I was the vice president of one of the largest Century 21 groups for, let's just say, a really long time, a really long, 21, 22 years, something like that. Started when I was nine years old. I have a Mega team with EXP, it's uh, in the top 250. Um, it moves back and forth, sometimes closer to the top 100, sometimes closer to the top 200. And I spend a lot of time on working with scripts and presentation materials for my team. Um, I have a nice little team. I have right now 124 team members. Uh, scattered throughout the state of California. And um, I was going to talk today, Tom suggested that we talk about scripts for the NAR settlement. And let me just see, uh, and I'm going to paste in the chat. This is a link to some of the documents that I use when I'm going through um, working with sellers and working with buyers regarding the NAR settlement. Uh, I have my own presentation. I have borrowed from some of the materials that EXP has provided, plus some of my, you know, homebrew. Um, I didn't include the whole presentation, but just the parts that are really relevant to the NAR settlement. Um, you're welcome to do whatever you want to with them. Um, I've put together some of the scripts that I use in that, and I was just going to go through what I do in a presentation I've had. I participate with my team in buyer and seller consultations. <clears throat> I get on a Zoom call. This is for both buyers and sellers uh, to answer any questions. We I mean, Let's just start with the seller one first, just because, hey, that's where... Um, and so this is a selection of some of the slides that I go over when I'm talking to a potential seller. <clears throat> Emphasis is going to be on the new rules. Maybe you've heard this. I've had sellers say, you know, I hear that we don't have to pay. I don't have to pay the buyer's agent anymore. I hear that it's illegal. It's immoral. Uh, it's unconstitutional to pay a buyer's agent. I don't want to do it. Um, I've also had sellers say, um, I want to do it. I want to incentivize agents to sell my house. So I've gotten a variety of responses. So when I'm presenting this in a listing presentation, I emphasize that we need to do two things to market your property. One is we market it to the general public. 
And then the other thing we have to do is market it to real estate agents. And this is from the 2023 NAR buyer and seller generational trends where they asked buyers, how did you find the home that you purchased? And 29% of them said that their real estate agent found it. So I want to emphasize that later on, where Mm -hmm. do we really want to lose 29%? You know, do we want to incentivize those agents to work on selling the house? Um, I go through a little bit of the history of the compensating agents. A lot of the sellers that I've talked to don't really realize that it was an NAR settlement. They don't even know what NAR stands for, let alone understand, you know, all of that. But essentially, so I refer to it as a court settlement. I I point out, I had somebody yesterday say, well, you know, I hear the standard 6% commission is gone, that commissions have been lowered, that there, there's a new standard commission. I heard that yesterday. And I, so I want to make a point that there isn't and hasn't been a standard commission. The commissions have been negotiable. And I always point out that I've been doing this for a long time. Believe me, real estate commissions are negotiated. I've been on lots of listing appointments where it was what we negotiated. And in my area, the typical commission is around 5% rather than 6 Your area may vary. In terms of the court settlement, what I explain is there's no mention anymore of cooperating agent compensation in the MLS. Now, I choose those words carefully. I don't ever say to a seller, do you want to pay the buyer's agent commission? I I don't say that because I'm pretty sure the answer is going to be no, right? Would you be interested in incentivizing cooperating agents? An agent, a cooperating agent is an agent who brings a ready, willing, and able buyer that is making an offer on price and terms that you accept then we compensate a cooperating agent, right? Now, I understand a lot of them haven't seemed to be all that cooperative at times, but it's a better phrasing, in my view, than talking about the buyer's agent commission. Um, So it can't be mentioned in the MLS. And the way I position this is that historically, what would happen when you're selling your property is that you would pay a Flat, a flat percentage, a overall percentage, let's say it's 6%, and 3% would go to the listing agent and 3% would go to incentivize a cooperating agent to assist us in selling your house. Now, what's changed is that I'm no longer the middleman where you're not paying me and then I'm paying them. By the way, if you're at EXP, even though the NAR settlement and the NAR FAQ seem to say you can still do this, we're not doing it. And by the way, in California, where I'm located, I'm in Silicon Valley, uh, but in California, the residential listing agreement as modified by the lawyers at the California Association of Realtors no longer has the option of the seller paying me and me paying a buyer's agent. And the reason is because that was the heart of the lawsuit. And we don't want uh, splitting commissions is what caused the problem in the first place. So the middleman role of you pay me and I pay the other agent has been eliminated, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to incentivize cooperating agents who've got ready, willing, and able buyers. We just can't say it in the MLS. Now, if you're not familiar with the rules, we can, there's a two-click rule. So we can't have a link in the MLS that says where the cooperating agent compensation is. We can have a link to a link in the MLS. So in my area, we use, in California, we use what's called Disclosure I.O. or Glide as a way of distributing the, you know, disclosure packages and things like that. We can't have in the disclosure package the cooperating agent compensation and have that link in the MLS. 
We can, however, in the MLS say, if you want the disclosures on the property, email me at. Because if they send me an email, I can now respond to the email and say, this is how much the seller is interested in paying a cooperating agent. But I can't put the link in the MLS. I could have it on the for sale sign. I could have a writer that says 2.5%, 3%. I could do that. I could put it on a flyer. I could go to a board tour and announce it. I could put it on a voicemail where when agents call me for information about the property, I tell them I just can't put it in the MLS. Right? So it's important that <coughs> excuse me, we and the sellers understand that. The other change, of course, is, is that before touring homes, the buyer and the buyer's agent should have a representation agreement. But I emphasize sellers can still offer cooperating buyer agent compensation through concessions. Right? They can still do that. Um, this is something that I borrowed, let's just say, from EXP. Um, I used some of their slides as to explaining what are buyer agent concessions. This can all be downloaded in EXP's toolkit. So I go over that the fact like the one of the largest MLS, the largest MLS in the country happens to be in California. Who'd have thought it's called CRMLS, the California Regional Multiple Listing Service. It has over 100,000 members and almost 50 percent of the transactions last year involved a concession of some sort. So I point that out that, and by the way, Bright MLS has also said something very similar. So the idea that sellers are giving a concession isn't a new idea. It's not a weird idea. It's been around for a long time. They've done it for interest rate buy downs. They've done it for repairs and other closing costs. It's not that unusual. And now it can also be used as a concession to compensate a cooperating agent. And there are benefits, of course, to doing this. And I point out to sellers, there are some sellers that may take the position, I'm not going to do it, I don't want to do it, I don't have to do it, I ain't going to do it. Um, other sellers, you know, and the conversation, of course, is going to be what's important to you. Is what's most important to you not paying a concession, not granting a concession to a buyer's agent? Is that really what's important or is netting the most money and getting a quick sale and having everything happen conveniently? What really is the goal and to refocus them on that goal? One of the sellers that I talked to recently started off by saying, I don't want to pay the buyer's agent commission. I'm not going to do it. And at the end, he was saying, well, yeah, uh, I, I would like to see offers. Because some of sellers, and this is what I said to them, you can take that position. But other sellers, and we're in a market where inventory is rising and price reductions are starting to happen more often. Other sellers are going to say, hey, give me your offer, right? I'm not against the idea. Let me see your offer. I want, I want all the offers that I can get. And if you're not going to offer a concession, then you're going to get less. Right, it may lead to lower sales prices. Now, so this part here comes from EXP. This is what I also go through: is I discuss that there are different kinds of buyers, and if you look at it like a gauge, you have on one end the full retail buyer. These are buyers that are oftentimes first-time buyers. They're planning on moving in. They don't want to do anything. I actually had a buyer, and I tell this story, who said, I want to buy this house rather than that house. And I was like, well, what's the difference? And they said, well, we like the paint color in the first one better than the second one. I'm like, really? You realize you could, you know, have the house painted, you know, any color you want to. And they're like, no, we just want to go with the one that, you know, we could just move in. Right? Those are retail buyers. They pay the most. They don't want to do repairs. They don't want to fix stuff. They just want to move right in. They want representation. 
And I've actually run the statistics in the area, whatever area we're doing the presentation on. And the one I did yesterday, 95% of all the transaction out of 1,200 recent transactions in my area, 95% of the buyers had their own agent. So I'm emphasizing we want those buyers, the retail buyers that are willing to pay more, they want representation. But then there are buyers that don't necessarily need an agent. These are the grizzled investors who have done this before. Those are the wholesale buyers. And they may be willing to forego working with an agent because they believe they already know what they're doing, but these are not the high offers. These are low offers. These are the low ball offers. So the question is, which kind of buyer are we? do we want to attract for your house? Wholesale buyers or the retail buyers? Um, I Giving examples, and whether or not I go into this depends on how much pushback I get on a compensating a cooperating agent. Like one seller the other day just said, yeah, I want to do it. No, I get it, right? Yeah, I, let's offer let, two and a half percent. I tell everybody I want to do it, right? But if they are like, well, I don't know. I, I want to make the most money. One of the examples I give are new home sellers. So I ask the seller, how many homes have you sold? This will be my first one. Right? Great. So this is not the kind of thing most people do that often. Some investors may sell dozens of homes, but the typical homeowner might sell once or twice or maybe three times in their life. Let's take maybe a guide from people that do this all the time, people for whom this is their business, like new home subdividers. Now, new home subdividers, in my area at least, are not members of the Board of Realtors. They're not members of the MLS. They never had to offer any compensation to a cooperating agent, but they do. In fact, as you may know, if you're a member of the MLS, the new home builders have given you your own website called New Home Source Pro. They do training every week on how to use their website, how to sell new homes. They offer in my area two to three percent compensation, typically to cooperating buyer agents. I've seen some much higher recently. So the question I ask is, why do you think new home builders offer compensation to a cooperating agent? Is it because they're charitable? They're worried about real estate agents not being able to put food on the table? This is just an income distribution thing they're doing. Or, or maybe they have studied this and they have determined that by cooperating with other agents, with buyer agents, they net more money, right? Which, of course, is the goal. I may also point out in commercial real estate, which I've done a lot of, I've seen a lot of commercial real estate closing statements, the big commercial companies, including EXPs, are not members of the Board of Realtors. They're not members of the MLS. There was no obligation to pay a buyer's agent a commission, but they do. Most of the closing statements in commercial real estate is a seller making a payment to a cooperating agent. Um, again, they do it because it makes them more money. 75% of for sale by owners are offering compensation to cooperating agents. Um, I don't necessarily have to go through all these examples, but if I get pushback on whether or not this is a good idea, then I would use those as examples. Um, I discuss who really pays. The, you know, if I ask an experienced agent, who pays the buyer's agent commission? Historically, who's paid? And I always say, well, the seller pays. Really, right? The seller pays. So the seller like puts money into escrow. What does the seller do? Wire transfer funds from the seller to escrow prior to closing? Well, of course not. All the money comes from the buyer and the buyer's lender. In fact, the money that pays the seller's closing costs, the money that pays the seller's agent, all the money comes from the buyer and the buyer's lender. 
Um, that's where the source of funds are. And the buyer has their own closing costs. Now, one of the things that we do is in addition to preparing a seller net, we also prepare a buyer cost analysis on the listing. So if we start off and we know, well, this is an $800,000 property roughly, and we you know, know what the seller's net likely is going to be because we've asked the seller, do you have a loan and how much is the loan and what is your interest rate? In addition, I prepare a buyer's cost analysis using what I would think would be a typical loan, usually 80% for that property. And the reason I do that is a lot of sellers, when they see their net sheet, all they see is all the deductions that are coming from their net. That's all they see. They don't see what the buyer is paying. And so when I show them that, look, the buyer has got their own list. This is what a typical cost to a buyer would look like over and above their down payment. Um, I also go through, because in the last one where I did this, the seller had owned the property for 10 years. So I find um, a graph that shows what, what was the interest rate like when the seller bought the property? It was under 4%. Right. What's it like now? Well, it's gone down a little. Right. You can see this one goes all the way up to July 1st. It's gone down a little, but it's closer to seven than it is to six. Right. It's just a little under seven percent. So since you bought the property, your interest rate is, you know, three and a half. The current interest rate is closer to seven. Um, I show what the appreciation has been, and I would break this. This one is for California, but I would do it based upon the particular locality of wherever the seller is. So this is what prices have looked like since you bought 10 years ago. And we get this information from the California Association of Realtors, which is their housing affordability index. And what I pointed out is that when the seller bought their house, the affordability index was about 50% in California. About 50% of the adults in California could afford to buy a house. Today, it's 17%. Now, what I'm doing with this is, first of all, who's in a better position to pay, to pay the buyer's the cooperating agent's compensation, right? It might be the seller, then it is the buyer, and that the buyers already have difficulty and that they may need assistance in financing their costs. Interest rates have skyrocketed, prices have gone up, affordability has gone down. I give them an example. I say, if you I need to move this over a little bit. I've converted things. <laughs> Anyhow, it's it's a bad habit I have. So um, I give them an example. If you if if you get an eight hundred thousand dollar offer, and the buyer is asking for a twenty thousand dollar concession, you're going to net seven hundred and eighty. Now that's what it would look like in escrow. If you say, I don't want to see any concessions on my net sheet to, I, I, to the buyer, I ain't going to do it, don't want to do it, it's illegal and immoral. Well, then that means that the buyer is probably not going to offer you 800000 because they have this $20,000 payment that they're going to have to make. Now, the actual deduction is going to be higher, which is my, my next slide. And one of the premises of this NAR settlement was that sellers would lower their prices if the buyer paid their agent directly. That's one of the premises. If you ask, well, why do they say that as a result of the settlement, their um, prices are going to go down? Well, the answer is because sellers won't be asking for as much money. Now, we all know that's not true, right? Sellers are not going to lower their price simply because um, the buyer is paying their own agent. They're not going to do that. They're going to want to get as much as they possibly can, right? But 
The premise is that in the past, the compensation to the cooperating agent was built into the price. Now, the phrase I use when I'm discussing this is the buyer wants to add their closing costs, including the compensation to a buyer's, a cooperating buyer's agent. They want to add that to the price they're offering. <clears throat> Why would they, what difference, and I had it so I said, well, I don't understand what's the difference. Right. If they add the twenty thousand dollars versus they pay the I, I don't understand. And it has to do with financing. So if the compensation to a cooperating agent is twenty thousand dollars and the buyer is getting an 80 percent loan, then it means the buyer has to come up with four thousand dollars out of pocket because 80 percent of the twenty thousand is being financed. If they have a 90 percent loan. They have to come up with only $2,000 out of pocket because 90% is being financed. If the seller says, I don't want you to build it into the price, then that means the buyer has to come up with $20,000. That's five to 10 times as much out of pocket just for this one line item. That's going to have an effect on the buyer's buying power. It's going to have an effect on how much the buyer can offer. Now, to you, the net, it doesn't matter, right? If they add it to the price and then get a credit for the 20000 versus deducting it from the price, your net is the same, but it makes a big difference to the buyer. And that's why I say on this side, the deduction would be more than $20,000, Right. It's because one in one way they can finance it, but in the other way they cannot. Unrepresented buyers. This is a question that we discussed in the past. Right. I'm sure many of you have, you know, what do I do if I'm a dual agent? Do I still charge six percent? Do I get to keep all of it? You know, what's what how does that work? So you may already have a plan. But one of the questions, and this is in the EXP residential listing agreement, it's in the California Association of Realtors new residential listing agreement. What if a, a buyer, and we don't know how much this is going to happen, but what if the buyer says, hey, I just want to deal with the listing agent. That way I don't have to buy, pay a buyer's agent commission. Now, one of the points I make to my, to my team members is that just because you're the only licensee doesn't mean you have to be a dual agent, right? A dual agent represents both sides. You don't have to do that, at least not in California. You can be the agent of the seller and the buyer can not have an agent. And you can simply help the buyer fill out forms. Now, what that looks like, by the way, for the buyer, and when we talk about buyer scripts, this is one of the things I would point out, is one of the differences is, is that the listing agent might give the buyer a copy of the homeowner association documents or a property inspection, but doesn't necessarily explain what it means. So the agent has fulfilled the role of, of, of disclosing, of communicating, any material facts with the buyer, but doesn't have to explain what they mean. That's up to the buyer. They've chosen not to have an agent. And in some cases, you might say, if you're the listing agent, get a lawyer to help you write the offer. But the question that you have to ask the seller is, do you want me? If a buyer comes to me and doesn't have an agent, do you want me to represent the buyer as well and to fill out the forms and explain stuff to them? Do you want me to? Now, one of the things that I put in the in the uh, folder that I shared is 105 more ways. Now, the NAR has a 179 things that the listing agent does to help sell the property. This is 105 things that a realtor might do in helping somebody buy a home. Now, the reason that's included in a listing presentation is because of this issue. Here's 105 things I'm going to have to do if you want me to help a buyer, right? I should be paid more. 
Now, you understand if you're a seller and you're thinking, wait a second, if the buyer doesn't have an agent, I'm going to have to pay you more. Yeah, maybe I should just hire a buyer's agent. Um, increased workload, this is the 105 things. Um, this is a statistic I've seen all over the internet. I've heard reputable people repeat it. Um, don't ask me where the original source is. I, I don't know. Um, it makes sense, however, that the majority of litigation is when there's only one agent in the transaction. And can you understand if the buyer is buying the property and the seller has an agent representing the seller and no one is representing the buyer and the buyer later decides that they're not happy, do they have a better case of suing because they say, look at, I didn't even have an agent. They wouldn't let me compensate an agent. They, they wouldn't cooperate with me. I wanted to add it to the price and have my own agent, but the seller refused. They made me use the listing agent. The listing agent didn't help me understand anything. I, I'm, I'm mad. I don't want the house anymore. Meet my lawyer, right? So the part of the issue if you're the seller is if, the, if you're not going to compensate a cooperating agent, and they go and the buyer can't afford it, FHA loans and VA, they, they're getting in with a shoehorn anyhow. They can't afford it, maybe. So they now have to use the listing agent, but you're going to have to pay more because the listing agent is now doing both sides of the transaction and you've increased the chance that you're going to be sued. And of course, I would say to the seller, we're not, we don't want to be sued. As real estate agents, of course not, but we have errors and emissions insurance that covers us in case there is a lawsuit. It's a shame. It doesn't cover you. It doesn't cover you. Anyhow, so that's sort of what I go through with the different aspects of, because the big difference in the listing presentation is about how do we compensate a cooperating agent? Do you want to? How would we do that? And so far, all of the sellers I've talked to said, well, yeah, I get it. I want to do it. Or at least they say, well, go ahead and tell people I want to see the offer. Because they're not obligated. Even if the seller says, I'm willing to go up to 3%, you can tell people that. They're not obligated until the offer comes in and it says it in the offer. Right? Why not? Right? Why not look at the offer? Why not run a net sheet? Any, I see there's chat. Um, bah, 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 bah. Exactly, Fannie Mae, almost everyone allows financing without consulting the borrower as a loan credit. Yet there are, um, let me just see, function to supply and demand, interaction. So the buyer's agent commission, interesting. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and FHA have limits on how much of a concession a seller can give a borrower. It ranges from 6 to 9%. What I've been told by loan agents is that if the concession is in the purchase agreement, paying the buyer's agent commission, that they include that concession in the limit. However, if the concession is not in the purchase agreement, but in another document like EXP's direct compensation agreement, which says that the seller is going to pay the buyer's agent directly, it's not in the agreement between the buyer and the seller, then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, this is a third um party, I forget the name, interested third party, um, then it's not included in the concession limits. Right? That's what you should, you should confirm that with your loan agent. Treva has a question. Colorado's the odd bird in the country, and that's where yeah. uh, Jackie and I are at. And um, we are required to put that in um, on our contracts. So we may run into this interested party compensation. My understanding, and I could have this wrong, but I'm pretty sure with um, 
FHA, that's 6%. And I'm pretty sure with uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, it's three. So, you know, we could run into some issues upon inspection if we're negotiating other um, concessions in lieu of repairs, primarily because that could um, create an issue with interested party contributions. It, it's the- actually, um, could be as high as nine with Fannie and Freddie. Uh, it depends. Is it an owner occupied versus an investor? Right. I have a list. I don't include it here. And by the way, the um, I, I'm doing a class tomorrow, I guess, on what's generally called Palm Agent, which the different title companies have as their own branded version for buyer costs and seller nets and. The, the uh, it's a premium you have to pay a little bit extra but it's like 99 cents a month um there's a seller concession cheat sheet that is built into it and you can identify the type of loan and it gives you the amount but it depending upon who the borrower is it can be as high as nine percent now i don't personally see i mean my we do a lot of transactions I rarely see a, a concession that's approaching the maximum, right? And that's not something that comes up very often. But my understanding is, and Colorado, you're right, has different rules. They've actually said, as I understand, that they don't think that buyers should have to sign an agreement just to look at property, that looking at property is not something that requires a real estate license and all of that. I, I can't help that. But, um, you know, the NAR says something different. But any other questions about, let me see if I missed anything in the chat. I'm not sure lenders are going to count compensation now included as interest party contribution percentage total. Is that what you're referencing? What I've been told is that if it's in the contract, it's part of the interested party compensation limit. If it's outside of the contract, then as long as it's a reasonable standard amount, then they allow it. Yeah, that's, sorry, that was just what I was referencing. I I just like to bring to everybody's attention that when something similar to this occurred in the lending industry following the Dodd-Frank Act, the compensation to the good lenders actually went up. And when I was discussing this with uh, Stephanie Peck last week, that has been her experience so far as well. And uh, because the commission, the co-op commission is now not being put in the MLS, uh, some sellers are actually choosing to price more competitively, thinking that that may be an advantage, but then later agree to pay compensation because they don't want to exclude that particular buyer. As you pointed out, uh, roughly 95% of the buyers are coming with uh, representation. So why why would I want to exclude myself from 19 of the 20 buyers? And uh, I love how you added the point that, and the 5% that are remaining are very likely shrewd investors that are going to want to wholesale your property or uh, a- acquire it at a discount. And so you're effectively paying that and then some perhaps. Yeah, they're not the retail buyer. The retail buyers want an agent to help them. Right? Yeah. Now, related to this, and um, I have my own buyer representation package that we go over. I didn't include the whole thing, but I've taken like those 105 ways and other things and modified EXP's buyer representation toolkit. But what I'm sharing with you are some of the slides or, and again, this is an eight and a half by 11 of what we go through when we're talking to a buyer about why they need representation. Could you I, uh, share that with Megan so we could post it up? I, I put it in the chat, okay. the link to the folder. Okay, thank you. And I can do that again because not everybody was here when I did it the first time. Megan, can uh, you just put that on the yeah, You're welcome. You're welcome. I mean, in fact, if you wanted to see the whole thing, I would. A lot of it is, you know, I'd be happy to share the whole thing. I've actually created a website that my team can share. 
And so um, I'd be happy to share the whole thing. I was just focusing on the scripts today regarding the chain NAR settlement, but I have a, a longer buyer representation presentation. But this is the part that's really related. So when we're talking to a buyer about representation, we talk about three things, how to find a great deal. And the conversation is, if you're using Zillow and you're going to open houses on the weekend, you're never going to get a good deal. Because first of all, the good ones are sold before the open house on the weekend. Have you ever noticed that, that you're looking at open houses and on Friday they're gone, somebody got to it before you? And the line I use, because we've already asked them, how long have you been looking and what kind of properties are you looking for? And, you know, why haven't you bought one yet? We've already had that conversation. And I say to the buyers, you realize that your dream home has come on the market maybe several times and was purchased by someone else. How would you like to make sure that doesn't happen again? I'm not sure it's going to let me look at this in a bigger format. So um, in, I, I mentioned EXP exclusives. I have a longer version of this, but the, I usually don't need to go into the long version because this is usually enough. Um, we have off-market properties, uh, for sale by owners, new home subdivisions, notices of default, EXP exclusives, we're going if we don't find it on the market right now, we're going to find out who owns a property like you want, and we're going to contact them and let them know that we have a buyer for the property and see if they want to sell. Why not do that anyhow, right? You know, uh, and that you're going to get early access if something comes on. And one of the things I emphasize to my team is you want to. Don't wait for the buyer to tell you which homes they want to look at. You should be looking at the MLS and Zillow, because sometimes Zillow has properties that are not in our MLS. If it's if you're in an area where there's a lot of MLSs and things like that, you should be saying to your client, hey, did you see the one that came on the market tonight? Did you notice that property? It looks like it's ticking all the boxes. When, when can we go see it? Then negotiating the contract, these are the three ways in which we can help you get a good deal. Who do you want negotiating the contract? The agent who is legally obligated to negotiate the highest price possible under the best terms possible for the seller? Or do you want to have your own agent? If you were getting divorced, would you use the same attorney your spouse was using? And then managing the transaction, who's going to pick out the inspectors? Who's going to read the reports? Who's going to give you advice as to what things you ought to ask for in terms of repairs or credits, or what are the big issues? Do you want the agent who represents the seller that's legally obligated to negotiate the highest price possible under the best terms possible for the seller, or do you want your own agent? Um, I This is something that I borrowed from um, a, a variety of places. It's basically an overview of what a buyer representation agreement is. Um, I recommend that my group, we have three price points. For example, if the property is in the multiple listing service, we want, let's say, 2.5%. If we have to find the property off of the MLS, we want more, right? If we have to go dig it up, right, because it isn't on the market, that, that's a more valuable service. And then if it's a new home build, it's a lower typically amount, but it's usually based, we figure out what the new home builders are building. So that, by the way, doesn't uh, va violate the NAR settlement. You can have more than one commission amount as long as it is specific and determinable. MLS property this, non-MLS property that, new home build, a different number. This is um, a list. And I, I saw another agent doing something and they only had 21, 21 contract terms and being a typical agent and being competitive, I used artificial intelligence to go through the California Association of Realtors purchase agreement. And we these are 43 negotiable contract terms. And again, the question is, who do you want helping you negotiate these 43 terms? The 
agent who represents the seller and is legally obligated to negotiate the highest price possible and to do the best terms possible for the seller. Is that who you want helping you with these 43 negotiable terms or do you want to have your own agent? Now, the question of, well, why don't I just go to the listing agent? Why have a buyer's agent at all? And I talk about the balance. If the listing, if, if you don't have your own agent, then you're up against the seller and the seller's agent. If you have your own agent, it is more balanced. And this is the one that usually, what, what could the listing agent do versus your own agent? Well, the listing agent could show you the house. The listing agent could recommend lenders. The listing agent could turn over inspections reports and H documents and things like that. And the listing agent can explain forms. But the listing agent, if they're not a doula, if the, the listing agent cannot give you advice and counsel, right? Because you're unrepresented. They're not going to keep your position confidential. If you let it slip that you're willing to pay more than the list price, they're going to tell the seller. The listing agent is not going to negotiate price in terms favorable to you. They're legally obligated to negotiate the highest price and the best terms for the seller. They're not going to give you reasons not to buy. They're not going to go through the documents and say, hey, look at this one. Did you see what the HOA said? You know, you ought to pay attention to that. They're not going to honestly evaluate the property value. They're much more likely to cherry pick comparables that justify the list price rather than show you comparables that might suggest a lower price. They're not going to disclose confidential information. If they hear from a neighbor that the seller is selling because they have to, because they need to move and they're under a lot of pressure, they can't tell you that because they work for the seller and they have to keep that information confidential. They're not going to write the offer to your advantage. They're not going to have expanded ability to find homes. All they're going to do is show you that one. They're not going to show you off-market properties or other properties that might actually work out better for you, and you're not going to get the greatest commitment unless you have your own agent. So these are pieces of my overall buyer representation package. Again, I don't necessarily go through all of them. I haven't gotten a lot of pushback where, but, but this is what we, we say if they're saying, well, why don't I just go to the listing agent? Well, this is awesome, Mike. So if someone wants to reach out to you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, Venmo me. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so... <laughs> If you follow Mike on Facebook, he's got quite the uh, comic uh, relief. Yeah, so that's why I put in my email address. Well, hey, Mike. and I'm on I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram. You know, I have a YouTube channel called Upthink Real Estate, where a lot I have 700 videos, something like that. If you've got insomnia, I've got the YouTube channel. We'll find you. Well, Mike, right. hey, thank you so much. This was a wealth of information. Thank you so much. Um, now we all got our inspiration. Time to put in the perspiration. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you soon. Now, Tom, Dave, so you're Mike. telling everybody to perspire. And I'm looking out at your background, seeing nothing but beach. That's right. Only a, you know what? This could have never happened. Without EXP. Where are you, Tom? Um, I'm in Maui right now, Sheridan Maui. It's my wife's birthday and it's our anniversary. Huh? So I'm totally off the grid. I'm using my backup vacation phone. So uh, thanks to my great team with Eric and Stephanie and Natalie. Um, and thanks to EXP. Um, I would have never been able to do this for 10 days. I love it. So thanks, everyone. We'll see you soon. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Tom. Bye.